working our way through Hebrews. This is part 15 of the book of Hebrews. The hearing of faith. Why you might not believe what you think you believe. And you might not believe this. Our text is still Hebrews 4, 1 and 2. Hebrews 4, 1 and 2. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, we spent a week talking about that, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us, there's an us and a them. The us is actually two groups. It's the people to whom the book of Hebrews was originally written. Jewish converts right on the edge of being pulled back into Judaism and under the law. And the other us is us, as the Holy Spirit applies God's word to us. The them, right there, that's the children of Israel at Kadesh. Twelve spies went into the promised land. You remember the story. They came back. Ten said, it's a no-go, even though God said... He would be with us. It's a no-go. Joshua and Caleb said, we're well able to do this. But the people rebelled. And a lot of people don't know this. Later on, they tried to enter. They, just, they changed their minds and wanted to enter. And they were pushed back and they couldn't. And they couldn't because they didn't receive... The word from the Lord with faith. And God was judging them. And that whole generation, if you recall, wandered around in the wilderness until a whole generation died off. 600,000 people died in the wilderness. And so the writer's trying to make this point. Good news came to us, just as to them. The message they heard did not benefit them. Because they were not united by faith with those who listened. They didn't copy the faith of Joshua and Caleb. Okay? I admit it. I've been stuck in these first two verses of chapter 4. It's our third week in this same spot. This is either caused by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Or I'm just mentally obtuse. I don't have enough discernment to judge that. You'll have to figure that out for yourself. Next Sunday, we will move on to the rest of the chapter. Now, we've wandered around in a lot of details, but the big idea of the last part of chapter 3 and the first two verses of chapter 4, it isn't really complicated, though we've taken a long time unpacking it. The idea is fairly simple to state. God's word brings no benefit to the hearer unless that hearing is a hearing that is mixed with faith. We looked at two translations of the same verse. The ESV 4.2 For good news came to us just as to them but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united they were not united by faith with those who believed. They didn't copy Joshua and Caleb's faith. NASB makes it maybe a little bit more clear. Same verse. For we indeed have had good news preached to us just as they also. But the word they heard did not profit. So instead of benefit it's profit. Because it, that's the word, was not united by faith in those who heard. The people being referenced... In both those verses are the Israelites at Kadesh. God speaks to them about going into the promised land. It is a good land. He will supply their needs. He will defeat their enemies. But only Joshua and Caleb hear this word from the Lord with faith. All the other people knew it was God speaking. That's not the issue here. Recognizing this is God's word and reading it is not the same as hearing the word with faith. 
600,000 people all heard God speak. But it didn't do them any good at all. They all knew it was God. But it didn't do them any good at all. And so 600,000 people, an entire unbelieving generation, they die under God's judgment in the wilderness. They never enter the promised land. They didn't hear God's word and mix it with faith. So that is the importance of hearing the word with faith. It's not enough... It's not enough to believe an event in God's word actually happened. It's not enough to believe a statement in God's word is actually from God. It's not even enough to agree that what God has spoken in his word is true. Mental agreement is not the same as the hearing of faith. We took two weeks, two weeks on that. And then we spent an entire Sunday morning defining what the hearing of faith is. The text we were looking at, Hebrews 11, 1, the heart of the definition. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And I, I said in there that the old King James has that lovely word we're all more familiar with. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Substance. That's a perfect word for it. Faith gives substance to things unseen. Not just acknowledging them, agreeing with them. The, the, the hearing of Faith makes invisible things, past and future, it makes those things substantial, substance, in my life right now. And so we talked about that last week. Your faith and mine is full of presently unseen realities. Some are in the distant past, the incarnation, the cross the resurrection, the ascension. All of those things happened a long time ago. There's just no way outside of some science fiction movie of transporting yourself back there to those physical events again. They're, they're unseen. You can't touch them. You can't hold them in your hand. They happened a long, long time ago. I can't give, I can't give physical, material substance to any of those things anymore. Some unseen things are still in the future. The second coming. The resurrection of the dead. The final judgment. The new creation. The church doesn't talk anywhere near enough about the new creation. None of those things has happened yet. I can't make any of them materially, physically present. And so here's where we landed. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the conviction of things unseen. So physicality, like this, physicality is not the kind of substance the hearing of faith gives. Things long past, things yet to come, they can't be made materially present. Not right now. And, and that's not the kind of substance the writer of Hebrews says faith produces. It's a different kind of substance. Well, what kind is it, Pastor Don? The hearing of faith, this is how we were wrapping up last week. The hearing of faith gives a present moral substance to invisible things. It gives it gives moral application to events, statements from God's word. The hearing of faith shapes and conforms my present life, my present affections, my present decisions. 
The hearing of faith shapes my life around these presently unseen things. And we spent all last Sunday looking at specific examples. The hearing of faith as it relates to the cross. The hearing of faith as it relates to the resurrection. The hearing of faith as it relates to coming judgment. That's all online. You can look at it. I, I don't have time to do it all again. So today's emphasis is the logical conclusion to this three-parter on these two verses. If the hearing of faith is so crucially important, and I think the text would say it is, if nothing of God's revelation brings any benefit to me without the hearing of faith, so how, how can I learn to do that better? Somebody pick up the phone. How can I learn to do this better? What, what are the ways in which I can join with the Holy Spirit in tuning my ears and tuning my heart to the hearing of faith so that the word I receive from the Lord doesn't leave me without benefit and without profit, but it accomplishes God's purpose in my life? Okay, what, what, what can we do to put ourselves on this pathway. Point number one. I have two thoughts I want to leave with you. In all the daily uses of our mind, there is nothing more destiny shaping than meditating on spiritual things. I want to look at another text and come back to Hebrews. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. So in all the daily uses of your mind, it gets used a lot every day. Planning, organizing, thinking about words to say, thinking about where you're going, choosing directions, building relationships, making decisions. You use your mind in all of those things. But in all the daily uses of your mind, there is nothing more destiny shaping than meditating on spiritual things. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit. So there's this Trinitarian reference right up front. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, liberty in some translations. And we all with unveiled face, this is the verb I want to focus on, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. What image is he talking about? Well, that one, the Lord. From, from one degree of glory to another. So it's a gradual process. It's not instantaneous, he's saying. It's incremental. For this comes from the Lord, again, who is the Spirit. Now, the third chapter of 2 Corinthians is a pretty involved chapter centering on the difference between the old covenant of law, that's the repeated reference to Moses in that chapter, and the new covenant of grace and the inward work of the Holy Spirit. If you had to try and pick out one verse that kind of summarized the whole chapter, you might pick verse 14. I didn't read that one to you. But their minds, this is the, the children of Israel, Jewish people, for to this day, that's as Paul writes, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away really interesting what he says there. It's not the subject of today's teaching, but the idea here is no one can properly grasp the whole picture of God's revelation, old covenant, new. No one can get the whole meaning of God's redemptive plan unless they're, get, unless they're right about Jesus Christ. So, so what Paul is saying is no one can help but misunderstand God's revelation 
apart from seeing everything coming to a, a glorious, grace-filled, Holy Spirit-fueled completion of it all in Jesus Christ. So apart from the work of the Holy Spirit in revealing Christ, human hearts will remain bound and blind and confused. This is the explanation of every religion on the planet. If you don't get Christ right, you will get everything else wrong. But there's something else that's really fascinating in our text. I want you to look at it one more time carefully with me. Same verses, 17 and 18. Now the Lord is... Look at the references to the Holy Spirit. The Lord is the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. So there's transformation. This comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So this is, this is fundamentally a Holy Spirit text. And it's fundamentally a freedom text. And it's fundamentally a transformation text. But the real point of these two verses is nothing in this process of transformation is automated. All right? Don't you love things that are automated? You have one of those coffee things, you take the little pod, you put it in. Do you want it strong? Do you want it medium? Do you want eight ounces? Do you want 10 ounces? Rini looks for the extra caffeine button. There's not an extra caffeine button. That's all. I make my own tea and coffee now, all by myself. <laughs> yes? It's all automated. You take it, you put it in, you slap it down, you hit a button, boom. This is a text that's saying, in terms of becoming like Jesus, nothing is automated. Nothing is automated. And the key, the key to opening up these two verses is found, I think, very significantly smack dab in the middle. And it's in beholding the glory of the Lord. Beholding the glory of the Lord. The NASB actually says beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. It's that verb. It's that verb beholding that kind of catches my attention. It's in the middle of this great text on the work of the Holy Spirit and the potential for incremental transformation. And right in the middle of it all is, is beholding. The, the Spirit does the transforming, but we do the beholding. Or maybe it would be better to say the Spirit does the transforming as we do the beholding. No beholding, no Holy Spirit transformation. It's not automated. I think that's a better way to understand this text, and I want to try to show you why. Interestingly, there's another text about mirrors and beholding in the New Testament. And it makes the very same point, only this text is going to make the point in a negative direction. What happens when we don't properly behold? That text, you probably know it, it's in James. James chapter 1, 19 to 24. Know this, my beloved brothers, so he's, he's writing to the church, Christians. Let every person be swift, quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. So here's an issue, anger, temper. The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. 
Therefore, put away all, now we've got some other things. Filthiness. Rampant wickedness. And receive with meekness the implanted word, notice, which is able. No problem with the word. Able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only. This is interesting. Deceiving yourselves. I take that to mean that it is very easy for someone like me and someone like you today to think that because we, we somehow got our, our heads around a passage that we accomplished what God wanted for our lives in a service like this. Right? That's us. There's a, there's a deception that settles in that the, that the process is done before it's done. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, and now you get the same image that we looked at from 2 Corinthians. He is like a man who looks intently at his natural face. See it? In a mirror. There it is again. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. There's a lot going on in that text. You could spend a whole morning on it. Don't panic. We're not going to. James pictures a person with a bad temper. Anger. Then James pictures a man or a woman all bound up in habitual sin. Filthiness. Rampant wickedness. Rampant wickedness means uh, wickedness that is culturally acceptable so that it runs wild. There's, there's no pressure pushing it back in the box. And then James quickly presents God's provision for poor souls such as these. God has a fix. The word of God, he says, is able to save your souls. Underscore able. There is no want of power, no lack of power in God's word to reconstruct broken lives. But there is a problem. Though the word is sufficient, power filled in every way, these people aren't being benefited by what they hear. And right away when I said that, Everyone in the room should have said, I remember that word, benefited. Because in our Hebrews text, it goes back to the children of Israel at Kadesh, and he says, they didn't hear it with faith, they were not benefited. Remember? So here's people, James is talking about them. It's not like the 2 Corinthians text, beholding as in a mirror are transformed from one degree of glory to another. Praise God, this isn't like that. So that word benefited takes us right back to the Hebrews 4, 1 and 2. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us, just as to them, but the message they heard did not say it. Benefit them. Because they were not united by faith with those who listened. So that's, that's what that Old Testament example in our Hebrews text is all about. It's what James is talking about. Hearing the word in a way that brings no profit, no benefit. So in the reference to the children of Israel at Kadesh, in our Hebrews text, let's just ballpark the numbers. Let's just say 600,002 people heard the same word from the Lord. 600,002. And the word of the Lord didn't benefit 600,000 of them. Those are not good odds. So, the writer of Hebrews warns his new covenant believers and warns you and me today not to hear God's word the way those followers of Moses heard it. They didn't mix their hearing with faith. Now, what we're trying to understand is 
How can we incline our hearts to meditate deeply on spiritual things? And so we looked at two texts. Just a quick review. The two texts we looked at are right here. The positive is in 1st, 2 Corinthians 3.18. We all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. James gives you the opposite. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself, here's the words, goes away, and at once forgets. So here, transformed from beholding, here, forgetting because of leaving. Okay, everybody see that? So James says our person spinning out of control with a bad temper and our person bound by inward dominating sin and habit, they need the word of God. That's what he says. And he says the word is powerfully able to bring about transformation. It's able to save your souls. But these people aren't being saved in James' example. These people aren't being changed. Nothing is working right. They are getting no benefit from standing in front of the mirror of God's word. They're getting nothing. Same temper, same sins, no transformation. And here's the don't miss point. James tells us why these people are not benefited from hearing the word of the Lord. And it's exactly the substance of our first point where I said the most important thing you will do with your mind on any day is meditating on spiritual things. That's not a guess. It's not a sermon point. James tells us that that's the problem. In verses 23 and 24 of James 1, if anyone is a hearer of the word, not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. He, it's, this is a person who reads the Bible. That's the point. Maybe he reads it through every year. Maybe he teaches a Sunday school class. This is not someone unfamiliar with the word of God's grace. He looks at himself, goes away, and at once forget, forgets what he was like. Well, Pastor Don, it's not complicated. The fact that this person isn't a doer of the word, it's obvious because James tells us. So there's the problem. And I don't think it is. Not the whole problem. When you say this person's just a hearer and not a doer, as he looks at the word fairly regularly, intently it says, something in me wants to ask, well, why isn't he a doer? Other people are. Is this person just intentionally rebellious? Is this person just kind of spitting in God's face? I'm not going to listen to you. Well, maybe. We're not told but I don't think so. I don't think so. These, these readers that James is talking about with their bad tempers and their inward corruption and sin, these sin-tortured readers, they aren't doers of the word, true enough, but the disobedience may have a less obvious root. I think that's what James is driving at when he says... These sin-bound people, they look into God's word the same way careless people look into a mirror. They look into a mirror and there's an immediate effect. They do actually see... Man, my hair is a mess. I need to wash my face. What in the world happened to my eyes while I was sleeping last night? They used to be white. You know, what, and, they, and they, they look into the mirror and there's an immediate effect. They actually see what's wrong. 
It's, it's not as though that moment in front of the mirror is totally useless. No. Rather, it's that moment wasn't sustained with its impact. 124 of James. For he looks at himself, then goes away. That's what happens first. He leaves. The result of that leaving is... At once, he forgets what he was like. In other words, as long as the mirror's there, he can see it. It's when he leaves, it's like the mirror never existed. I hope I'm making you see what I'm talking about here. There's a proper use of a mirror, sort of, but not completely. And James means for all of us to link up this picture, this picture of a physical mirror, James intends, obviously, for us to make the mental link between looking in a mirror and hearing God's word. And the point James wants to make is that the hearing of faith isn't short-term hearing. The hearing of faith is, is hearing and listening to God stretched out. It's hearing that doesn't stop when the Bible is put away. And there's only one way for that to work. The Holy Spirit only empowers truth that is meditated on. And we all, Paul says, 2 Corinthians 3.18, with unveiled face, beholding, beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So that's our first point. This hearing of faith is greatly deepened as we recognize there is no possibility of transformation in Don Horbin's life by the Holy Spirit, apart from Don Horbin continuously meditating on spiritual things. The minute you leave spiritual things like the James Mirror story and walk away from them, you'll forget. You'll forget. The only truth the Spirit uses is truth that's meditated on. Spiritual things need more than a light hearing. You will never grow in Jesus if you got your one hour Sunday morning and we'll see you next Sunday at 10. Won't work. There's the need for a deep embedding in our minds. You know how you buy sunglasses? I've used this illustration before. Green tinted sunglasses. You put them on and everywhere you go, everything looks what? Green. That's meditating on spiritual things. So you've got these truths from God's word, and everywhere you go, everything you see, say, and do is, is through the color of God's revelation. Everything. It becomes the lens through which you see everything in life. Point number two. There are only two, so we're almost done. My dad used to teach homiletics at a Bible school in Saskatoon, and I was in the class where a kid put up his hand and said, how many points should a sermon have? My dad instantly said, well, at least one. I thought that was a good... <laughs> Point number two. The Holy Spirit will faithfully grow our love for spiritual realities we have made dwell continually in our minds. How do you make yourself love the things of the Lord? That's a profound question. 
I mean, our affections, are they under our control or aren't they? Why do some people like chocolate ice cream and some people like vanilla? Where did that preference come from? Can we control our affections? And in this case, we can. In this case, we can. Colossians 3.16. This is the same idea now as the 2 Corinthians text about beholding and being transformed. The opposite of James and the walking away from the mirror and forgetting. So this is about the word again. Let the word of Christ, and here's this, you know, the beholding word. Here it's dwell in you richly. So that's the instruction. Everything else here on to the end is... ...how this happens. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly... ...and then teaching, admonishing with all wisdom... ...singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, thankfulness... ...that's how you let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So the activities of the last portion of that verse... ...are just the means by which the word of Christ is made to dwell. Dwell. Let it dwell. Not visit... Dwell. So dwelling is more than knowing. Dwelling is more than reading. Dwelling is more than agreeing. Dwelling is more than admiring. Paul has in mind a kind of constant inward spiritual intuition. He's talking about a kind of inward shaping. Worship grows from this inward indwelling. Thankfulness grows from this inward indwelling. Love grows from this inward indwelling. You can't love what you don't set your heart on. You, you can't make yourself love Jesus just by trying really hard singing two or three praise choruses in a church service. That's very important. I'm not belittling it. Worship needs to be expressed, passionately expressed. What I'm saying is, is, is different. You can't, you can't make yourself love Jesus by squinting your eyes closed a little higher or raising your hands a little higher. Without this meditative, inward dwelling of the word, spiritual things will always be limited to temporary periods of spiritual excitement. We will be limited to temporary pangs of conscience at sin. There'll come spiritual insight and joy for brief periods. You, you, you can't trick your mind into loving spiritual things. This can't be faked before God. Only as the word dwells in an embedded fashion will the Holy Spirit cause love for spiritual realities to outshine everything else. This is what the hearing of faith does. It, it meditates on what it hears constantly. So it never dismisses it. it, it it's... It, it stretches out the hearing, the thinking about spiritual things. Then what happens is the Holy Spirit starts to shape the life around the truth that is constantly meditated on. And then what happens is the Holy Spirit causes you to love the things that you constantly meditate on. Paul talks about this now we really are almost done. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. And here's the best definition of spiritual life in the New Testament. But only faith working through love. Faith working through love. And immediately what we tend to do is think of love like for the needy, love for the poor, love for our enemies, love expressed socially toward other people. And that's included. 
But don't limit it to that. What it's talking about is a love for the things of God, a love for his word, a love for prayer, a love for worship, a love for holiness, a distaste, a growing distaste of sin. This is what makes faith work. This is what the hearing of faith is all about. Spiritual things meditated on, prolonged, beholding, indwelling of the word. Until the Holy Spirit starts to generate a love. People miss this. How many people start to develop a life of prayer? I, I haven't been good at my devotions. I need to pray every day. And they do it for a month. And it doesn't fizz on them. It's not fun. It's not what the preacher told them their prayer life was going to be. And they pack it in. And the reason is this. They pack it in before they give the Lord a chance to cultivate a love for it. Truth meditated on, thought about, pondered, considered constantly like the green tinted sunglasses. The Holy Spirit will produce a love. It's not just charity, this love that Paul talks about. Acts of kindness and mercy to others. It includes that, but it's much more. The hearing of faith sets love upon the things God says. Love upon the things God promises. That kind of love is not in your power to turn on and off. It's the Holy Spirit that does the transforming. But you do the beholding. The Holy Spirit does the transforming. But you do the beholding. This is the hearing of faith. The hearing of faith requires prolonged meditation. Beholding the glory of our Lord. There are no shortcuts. That's why Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell. He says, dwell in us richly. Richly. You know what Paul means? Here's what Paul means. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. When he says richly, he means you can't overdo this. You can't overdo this. Most hearers will undervalue meditation, concentration on spiritual truth for prolonged stretches of time, and they will never make them substantial. Faith is the substance. You do the meditating. I don't mean sitting in a corner, you know, contemplating your belly button. I mean meditating on the word. In his law, he meditates day and night. That's what I'm talking about. So you don't just read. You think about what you read. Write down notes. Pray about what you read. Next day, start thinking about it again, what you read the day before. Give time to it. And here's what happens. The Holy Spirit will start giving you love for spiritual things. Who cares? You have crossed the Jordan River in your Christian walk when, when you not only pursue righteousness but when you start to prefer righteousness. That's where transformation really happens. Everyone said? Let's pray.